Okay, so uh, this is my first time doing this. This is actually my first one of these book clubs. This is my first time presenting. So I hope that uh, feel free to just jump in, especially if I go out of bounds somewhere or I'm way off the mark on something. But even if I'm not, you just have some great ideas. Please feel free to interrupt me as much as you want. Um, I'm going to mute my video just to save bandwidth here. Wait, well, that's, that won't affect the screen share, right? I don't think so. Let's see. You can still see it? Yeah. Okay, good. Ron, would you mind making it a little bigger? My eyes are old. <laughs> also, hello. Uh, I wouldn't mind. This is, my, sure. this is my first time as well joining this uh, thing. I keep I keep missing it because <laughs> it doesn't oh, pop up on my calendar. But but um, we have the A. Oh. Yeah, yeah. A. We have an A close to what you click there. We have A. Your audio is breaking up for me. I didn't hear what you were saying. Yeah, I couldn't hear Sam, sorry. Yeah, I say we have an A sim close to what you click search. We have A, capital A. I think if you click, you are increasing the size, the font, the font, I guess. Oh, this. Okay, gotcha. I'll try making it bigger. Oh, oh, okay. How's that? Very nice, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Brandon. Oh, I can't get this. Oh, it's up here. Thanks. I, I hope I can. Yes, welcome. So you, uh, this is your first time with this with this book club. Are you just are you just read up to now and caught up then? I I watched the first two videos, and I think oh, I, I I probably have one more where you guys started the linear model uh, part. I, I haven't I didn't catch up on that today, but I I hope to catch up and keep up with y'all for sure. Okay. Awesome. I was doing the tidy models book and uh, asking too many questions about why we chose particular models. And they were like, you just need to do the ISLR course. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, yeah, we did go through the first part of this chapter um, last week. And so we're just picking up where we were last time. Uh, last time, I think we closed with talking about the, uh, the model accuracy. We did the accuracy of the coefficients, and then we talked at the very end about assessing the accuracy of the model itself. And the two tools that the book mentions for this are the uh, roots, uh, the, the RSE, um, which I think is the, what does the R stand for? And I can't think of it. R squared error. Probably residual sum of errors. Ah, residual sum of errors. Yeah, I was trying to think what that R could be in that context. <laughs> residual sum of errors, right? So this is the remain. This is like you take your data, subtract out your fit, and whatever's left over is the residual, right? That's and then you take the, uh, the sum of the squares, errors of that, and then that's your uh, that's one measure. Which I didn't put the formula in here. I think it was on the last thing, wasn't it? Yeah, here it is. So this is what it looks oh, sorry, like. So it is a root as well, but it's actually residual. Standard error. Sorry. Residual standard error, yeah, okay. Some of errors could have worked too, but <laughs> residual standard error. And this is the formula for it for the linear, for the simple uh, linear regression case, uh, just the RSS divided by N minus two, because two is the number of, it's basically N minus the number of degrees of freedom, in which case there's two, because you have two parameters you're fitting, B zero and B one, beta zero and beta one. Um, but this RSE is also can be used to help uh, access, uh, assess your lack of fit. If there's a large amount of error left over, then you haven't uh, really accounted for much of the error. In fact, and then that leads us to the R squared statistic, which is an alternative that really bakes into a form of how, what proportion of the variance have you explained? And this is the formula for that. It's R squared. This R squared is equal to one minus the residual sum of squares divided by the total uh, sum of squares. So the total sum of squares is like, don't do any fit at all. What is the uh, what is this? What is basically like the variance, right? N times the variance, right? And then the residual sum of squares, what's left over after you've done the fit. So this tells you how much of the fit, how much does the, of the error is explained by the fit. That's how I looked at it anyway. You guys agree with that assessment, I hope? I'll take your silence as yes, or I've kind of completely mute. Yeah. So the next section of the book talks about multiple linear regression, and this just extends the uh linear regression to multiple predictors you just add them on to your model and like it's shown here in this equation uh, from the book 
And the interpretation of each of these betas then is the average effect on y by that particular predictor by you know x sub i uh the beta sub j oh actually that's i and j should be matching there i'm gonna fix that i haven't put these on this by the way i didn't mention this but i didn't put these i didn't do a pull request or anything for these it was just on my computer these notes when i get done i'll try to clean them up if you have any suggestions for how to clean up let me know and i will do that as well should make a note here fix that problem. But the process is basically the same. Now you're going to uh, minimize the residual sum of squares. Uh, by choosing, you're going to choose the parameters beta j so that you minimize the residual sum of squares. And how you do that is not really given in the book. It's just you have tools you use with our, you know, the linear model tools with our um, can do for you. This is kind of the approach I think this book takes. Like they introduce a couple of the formulations for like the, they, how to calculate the parameters for the simple linear regression and the errors on the parameters for a simple linear regression, linear regression but for more complicated things they don't they don't rip behind the they don't look have you look behind the curtain I think if you want to look behind the curtain you're kind of encouraged to go to the other more advanced book that they wrote uh, essentials of, of statistical learning I think so ESL so uh, this from, so for several parts in this book they don't tell you what the how to calculate these things other than you just use the tools you have with in the in the book in the app uh, in our studio or whatever tool set you're using uh so any in any event one of the advantages of multiple linear regression versus a single like in the book they mentioned hey if you have multiple predictors you could just fit them all individually so okay i'll just do a plot of y versus x1 and i'll fit that i'll do a plot of y versus x2 and i'll fit that and i'll see what the fits are like but the advantage of doing the multiple linear regression like this is you can reveal uh, what I think sometimes are called spurious correlations. So for their example, if you fit sales against newspaper, you would, you would get a significant slope from that 0.06 plus minus 0.02. But then when you include the radio sales in, into a multi, uh, multiple regression, the newspaper no longer is, has any significant effect. Because that was just a spur. Uh, there was the only reason newspaper had any effect because newspaper almost always went along with radio. Nobody just did plain radio. They would do radio and newspaper advertising at the same time. So it's really the radio that was doing it, not the newspaper. The newspaper was just coming along for the for the ride. That's how I interpreted that anyway. Kind of a spurious correlation. So that that's how I interpret it. Um, so then the book talks about there's some important questions about any of these multiple linear regressions that you should consider. Uh, one is, is there, do any of these predictors, uh, are any of these predictors useful in predicting the response? And this is again, one of these things where they just kind of throw at you this black box statistic, F statistic, and they give you some, I don't, I don't remember what it was, but they give you some heuristic understanding of why it should be close to one when there's no relationship, otherwise a lot bigger than one, but it's like how big it should be or whatever they say kind of depends. And I, I didn't really get a good feel for like how to use that F statistic from what I read so far. I'm hoping that it'll become clearer in the practical exercises and, and things like that. Did anyone else get a good feel for like that F statistic, like how to use it? Besides being bigger than one, like how big? I don't know. Depends. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time since I've had my intro to stats course, <laughs> but uh, I always thought it was that you looked up the F statistic in a big table. It was at the Z. Or are they connected? It's been too long. <laughs> no, I think helpful. you're probably right. I think you're right. There probably must be some statistics, uh, some model for what the F statistics should look like. That's probably, but they didn't really tell us about that. Maybe it's something that comes in the, again, in the practical part, they probably have something in R that will tell you, oh, this is a significant or uh, insignificant F statistic. I think yeah, statistic. I'm pretty sure the F statistic is an output of the LM summary, but I, I don't know. It is. Yeah. Does it also give like some kind of p-value for it? Maybe that's yeah. maybe it does. Oh, okay. Well, that'll so. tell you at least something. Anyway, not very helpful. Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. Appreciate that. No, I think it was helpful. So it's just one of those things that gets spit out that I always find a little mysterious and especially I'm also doing uh, trying to teach myself Bayesian statistics and I find that so much more intuitive it's like oh I see it's, it's just this is the model and you can just look at it right just simulate it and see what's going on but that's why I'm doing this because I really want to learn this approach as well by finding it less than intuitive hold on one second just trying to find something
Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. I just want, I just want to read, I just looked at that section of the book real quick again to see if they actually mentioned this uh, P values for F statistics. I didn't really see that mentioned. Now what they do mention is like for uh, going on to the next question, like do all, all the predictors help explain why, or is only a subset of predictors useful? And here is where they say, oh, you can look at the individual P values for each parameter. And that makes a lot of sense to me. So if a parameter is important, they should have a small P value. And if they're not important, they should have a large P value. However, they say in this section that you have to be careful. Like if you have a large number of parameters, then you'll just have small P values just by chance. You have a better chance of having small P values by chance. You have many, many parameters. So they mentioned some other techniques here of this, uh, of down selecting your predictors, uh, forward selection, backward selection, and mixed selection. And they didn't really, they didn't give a lot of examples of that, but it looks like in chapter six, this becomes a big topic, this whole model selection thing. So I didn't worry about it too much. I don't know if anything, anybody else has anything to add on that part of it. And then uh, the next thing is how well does the model fit the data? That's the third question. And here, R squared is another it's still a good statistic to look at how much of the proportion of the variance explained. And they, they also mentioned look at the RSE, but now the RSE is different because you have more degrees of freedom or less degrees of freedom, I should say. So it's N my, it's RSS divided by N minus P minus one. It's the same formula, but now instead of a two, you got P. P was two in the simple linear regression. Now P is whatever it is, how many parameters you are fitting. Because you have to include that zero with uh, intercept one, two, right? Ron, quick question. So in this, uh, in the case yes. of the simple, it was n minus two, so it could have been an n minus p where p was just two, right? right. No, 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 um, no, no, no. Because in simple linear regression, you just have one predictor. I'm sorry. Okay, um, I was just trying You're to right, relate it to the other one. Yeah, n minus two because you have one. You're right. So the 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 one. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. No, you're right. I misspoke. I said it's. P is two, and you know P was actually one in the in the simple. The zero uh, parameter beta zero is just is hardwired in there as the one in that denominator. So the P is the number of predictors. Predictors, and right? You, there's actually one, and then you have to subtract one more because of beta zero. So that's what that means. Okay, I, I misspoke, so I'm glad. You okay, that yeah, that that makes sense. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then finally, the third question is given a set of predictor values, what response value would we predict? So if, you know, now that we have this model, we want to do predictions, how do we do that? So you give me, you know, give me whatever predict, whatever values for the predictor you want to give me like this. So I'm spending this much on radio sales I'm spending this much on TV sales. Tell me how much, uh, I'm sorry, spending this much on TV marketing, spending this much on radio marketing. Tell me what my sales is going to be like. And there's three types of uncertainty in those predictions. The first one is going to be the uncertainty in the estimates of the betas themselves, right? Because you don't we only, get, we can only estimate them. They have some error bar associated with them with the software. We'll tell you what that is. Um, the bias in the model, that means the model maybe not that maybe the bottom maybe it's not that linear. So it's not that good of a model after all. So there's that effect. And then finally of course there's just the irreduc irreducible error in the um, that you can't do anything about it all. That's just the the, the random nature of the model itself, right? The epsilon part. So they mentioned there's kind of two kinds of predictions. I'm going to get this wrong because I forgot now what it was, but there's, um, you can prove, well, you want to predict the average sales and that you won't, you don't use the irreducible error on that part. Or if you want to predict a, a, a confidence interval in the sales, then you would use this irreducible error as well. Well, I guess you have a confidence interval in either case, confidence interval in the average sales you expect, and then you add in the irreducible error, and then you have a bigger confidence interval that would be for, uh, the actual sales versus the average sales. Did that make any sense at all? That sounded like a big jumbly mess, but any questions about that? Did that make sense? No, I think that that made sense. Sometimes I, start... um, I okay. Yeah, I think I didn't get the okay. intricacies as to why. So with the average, when you're just predicting, right, the confidence intervals, you're not looking at the irreducible error because it's an average, right? And so that averages out to zero, is that correct? Yeah. Whereas for each observation, you yeah, have to exactly the, right. Yeah, because it's a dot, right? Okay. All right. So they call it a confidence interval when you're quantifying the uncertainty around the average. They call it a prediction interval when you're actually saying, "Oh, what would what is the actual uncertainty you could actually have for the sales for this particular city?" So right. it's confidence right. versus prediction interval. Now I got it. I didn't catch. I didn't catch that in the slide. I didn't put that in there. I'm making no. No, actually, I think the way that you said it solidified it for me because I was just like, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> so that was helpful. Thank you. Yeah, so that's that. That's kind of the multiple linear regression 
fast, fast, uh, going fast through it, but I just wanted to make sure we covered that and understood the terminology of it, or at least that I think I have a better understanding myself anyway. I looked, I haven't done, I don't know if anyone, have any of you have done the, um, the lab part yet. I haven't done it yet, but I looked at it and it looks like doing the lab is going to help make a lot of these things clear because they're actually going to have you do these things and see, oh, like for example, you know, they talk about calculating the prediction interval, but they don't tell you how to do that. Like what formula would you use? Well, they don't, it's actually more, it's actually pretty complicated because there's all these correlations between the different um, estimates of the slopes and, and you have to take all that into account. Well, good. Well, fortunately in R, there's just a function called predict, which will just take care of all that for you. <laughs> so that's what I found out by looking at the lab. So they don't, that's, that's one of those cases again, where they don't tell you the formula, but if you did want to know, you'd have to go dig in to an alternate source, which I think is, you know, I keep harping on this because I'm just trying to remind myself, this is the kind of the, the scope of this book is meant to give you good, solid understanding of these things without having to get lost into the weeds of the, how to actually, you know, if you had it right, do it on paper and pencil or something, right? Like the math part of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I did yeah, do a data analysis yeah. class that was, um, it was helpful, but it was taught by someone that was a physicist. And so it was just so math heavy that sometimes I felt like I'm just losing like the thread of like, you know, like the intuitive feel for it. And so, um, you know, that's, I, I kind my, of appreciate that's exactly that they don't what my, go so deep. Yeah. yeah. That's actually probably my problem is I am a physicist. So. You are I'm okay. Like, Show me the math. <laughs> Show me yeah, the math. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so interesting. Okay, okay. Yeah. Any event, uh, that's that. Now, the, the next section is qualitative predictors. I didn't put much in the slides on this. It seemed pretty straightforward. They talk about this dummy variable technique where if you have a so a qualitative predictor, predictor, or sometimes called a factor, or there's some other words I think are used for these things. Categorical, right? Mm -hmm predictor yeah that's where the variable can take you know some number of values like they use an example of region where it's east west and south not north but just east west and south those are the three possible regions you could be from and they encode that by this dummy variable or sometimes called one hot method right so if you have k levels you introduce k minus one dummy variables are either equal to zero or one and they're only equal to one when the underlying predictor takes that value um and i just made a little uh, and then the, you fit the model, like, like just like you would any other, you just, as if it was just a regular linear model, uh, just as shown there, right? There's the equation. And, and I just made a little table to help illustrate exactly how that encoding works. So the baseline is zero, zero, uh, level one would be one, zero, level two would be two, zero, or zero, sorry, <laughs> zero, one, <laughs> excuse me. All right. So it's one hot type thing. If there's more levels, you'd have more, more, uh, more dummy variables to handle that. I thought that was all pretty straightforward. Um, I've seen other ways of doing that. And I mentioned this here, it's not from the book, but I just mentioned as an alternative is use what I call index variables, where you just use mm -hmm. a different coefficient for each level. So here you just have beta 0, 1, beta 0, 2, beta 0, 3, and that'd be it. And each one of them would, be, would be give you the uh, effect of that particular, being in that particular class or that category. Right. That's not the way the book does it. That's the way the Bayesians like to use that method because it, it works better with the uh, uh, with the Monte Carlo Markov chain and things like that. Let's see anything else to say about that? I don't think so. Um, so I'm moving kind of quickly through this part because I didn't really find it that in interesting or that challenging either maybe i'm missing something so if somebody wants to talk about anything that i skip over please let me know I'm happy to do that another thing i'm kind of skipping past is this interactions uh and the nonlinear things because again i think these are relatively straightforward um if you want if you think there's some interaction you think there's some effect of uh one variable affecting the way the other variable one variable i guess the way to think was if you think one variable one predictor could be changing the slope of another predictor you can add this inter interaction term and then see what happens. See if that's the case by looking at the p-value for that beta three, for example. And they go through that pretty well in the book, I thought. Same thing with the nonlinear polynomial things. I mean, to me, that's like pretty standard. Uh, just keep in mind, one thing about this nonlinear fit, it's not really, or polynomial fit, it's not really, it's a linear fit still. You're just adding these more variables to, uh, to try to fit high, you know, some other functional forms. You're basically doing like a bunch of transformations of the data and then fitting those transformations too. So it doesn't have to be like polynomial like I have there. It could be like other functional forms that you might think have some reason to be in there or splines or whatever else you might think would be useful. 
Uh, so that was just a breezing through that. This part, the potential problems thing, I thought was actually the most interesting part of the entire book, this entire chapter, because it's something you really have to think about, right? Like, I mean, okay, I did all this. I turned the crank on this LM thingy and R, and I got some answers out. I'm done, right? Well, no, you're not done. You really need to now go do the hard work of looking at what you got. And I'm glad that they spent a lot of time on this because it is easy for you to just like turn the crank and then go, here's what I got. And then, I mean, I'm guilty of that all the time. And the people are like, well, wait a minute, what about this? Did you, did you look at this? And like, uh, no, <laughs> oops, <laughs> better go back and check that out. So, uh, so they talk about how many problems did they say there were six potential problems to look for and uh, make sure that and check for, right? The first one is pretty obvious. Check to see, see if there's a, uh, some kind of, go ahead. Does somebody say something? No, I think Kevin was just getting on. Yeah. Oh, I thought he was. Hey, yeah, I'm at the airport. Sorry, uh, but I was. Able, we got here early, hey, so Kevin. Uh, yeah, I can join. And listen to the rest of it. Nice. Awesome. So the first thing is the not a possibility of a nonlinear relationship, and this they mentioned the most important tool for this is to look at the residuals. Uh, plot the residuals and see if there's any kind of remaining trends or something you're not accounting for. And if so, consider doing something about it. They mentioned transforming the data, you know, square root, log, rhythm, something like that. Uh, or maybe you might want to do a nonlinear relationship fit like we did for like a polynomial fit, uh, these kind of things. But it's important to at least check and see, did I account for the structure of, does my model account for most or the or even the important, maybe it's not perfect, but at least it accounts for the important parts of the structure. My residual might have some remaining curviness to it, but I'm like, if I, I'm okay with that, then that's fine too, right? Uh, let's see. The second thing is correlation of error terms. So this is important, right? So you have, you've done your fit, you look at your residuals and you really should take a close look at them to see if they're really true. I mean, all these, all this fitting that we've done assumes that the, that error term, the epsilon term is, is uncorrelated, actually assumes uncorrelated Gaussian noise, but, but at least it ought to be uncorrelated. And so that's something you should check too. And you can, you can, if you look at your residual, sometimes you can actually see, oh, wait a minute, it looks like it's kind of walking around. It's kind of got this, it's like they call it tracking. You know, sometimes some obvious tracking and then, well, wait a minute, there's like almost a sinusoidal tracking on here or something not right in your data. And, or you can actually do what's called autocorrelation of the, of the, of the residuals with itself just to see what the correlation, if there is any autocorrelation with it. Or as long as it's reasonably short, like one <laughs> or two, you're probably okay. Uh, I, I mean, that's, that's very heuristic, what I just said, right? I can't back that up. <laughs> that's what people seem to accept, right? Um, ideally, the error terms are, the residuals are completely uncorrelated, but I know that's not, that's an idealism, but you gotta at least know what, what it is, right? So that's that part. And then the other, next one is we also assumed the model, uh, the R functions that do this linear regression assume that the error terms are constant variance, or not constant, constant variance, that they're the same variance all the way through. And the book shows an example of where that's not the case. It shows the residuals uh, for some unknown model, but they're just showing a kind of a heuristically a little graph here where the residuals, the error, the variance of the residual grows as, uh, uh, as a function of the predictor. And when you, so you should, again, again, looking at your residuals will tell you this and you can say, oh, maybe I need to do something and maybe you need to transform your variables that they suggest for transforming the uh, the y variable. So it's kind of this again, some more, what do you call it? Um, I'm trying to think of the right, I'm trying to think of forensics of your data. I don't know. Uh, taking a look at what, doing some post checks on your analysis. The next one they talk about is outliers. Everybody knows outliers are, you have them all the time. But the, basically what you want to do is, you, again, you plot your residuals. This time, maybe plotting them versus, maybe standardize your, they recommend standardizing your residuals, uh, you know, dividing them by the estimated error. And then if you have any ones that are like three bigger, right, outside the three error bars, then that's probably about being an outlier, outlier. And they may not have much effect on your fit. You get the same slope if it's in the midst of the data, but it will have an effect on your RSD and also then on your fit. Uh, standard errors of your parameters as well. So, hey, maybe they're real. Maybe there's something wrong with your model. These are things you should look at. Maybe it's just a mistake in the data collection, or maybe there's something else. Um, the model some way in some way deficient is what they recommend doing about that. I know there's also some, and they don't talk about it in this book, I don't think, but something if you really have a problem with outliers, it's worth looking into robust um, regression techniques that exist. Sometimes there, I think there's some kinds of regularization that can take care of it too. 
Huber regularization or something like that? I don't know. Anyway, I saw that somewhere. Don't ask me to back that up with any additional information about it. <laughs> the next thing they talk about is high leverage points. These are like outliers, but instead of in Y, they're in X, they're like far off uh, the chart. And X in, in this, you can see this point label 41, the red point 41 is a high leverage point. It's away from the bulk of the data and it's pulling the fit up. It would, the fit would be the dash curve but because of this, this a high leverage outlier, so to speak. It pulls the curve up a little bit. So again, it's one of those things you have to check for. Um, you can check for them in the residuals, but sometimes if you have a lot of parameters, it's gonna be hard. You won't be able to see them. That's what this second plot there shows. Shows this red point. That's like, it's a high leverage point, but it's, Hard to see if you're just plotting predictor, uh, sorry, y versus x1 or y versus x2. You wouldn't see it because it's in the midst of it. But when you plot this x versus 1 versus x2, you can see, oh, this point is not with the rest of the data and could be causing me problems. And they've mentioned this again, they don't really tell you too much about how to calculate this for a general case, but they, the, mod, the summary, there is a, in the laboratory, they tell you how to calculate using R. There's leverage statistic, which is supposed to help you identify high leverage points, which you can then try to do something about again. What you can do about them, I'm not really sure. Maybe we'll find out later, but get rid of them if necessary. I don't know. I, again, I guess some of this is where it becomes more art and less science. You gotta, at least you should examine them and figure out what to do with them. And the last problem that they talk about is collinearity. This is where two predictive variables are highly uh, closely related to each other, highly correlated. They give an example in the book of what was it something about um, credit ratings, like your credit rating and your um, credit limit are clearly going to be highly correlated variables. So if you do a prediction based on both of them, multi-regression based on with both of those in there, you're going to have, uh, it's going to potentially cause your errors to look bigger than they really should be. Especially if you look at, what, one of the problems is the, the data reports marginal errors, right? It just tells you, oh, what's the error of the rating fit? What's the error of the uh, limit fit? And those two are correlated. So when you look at the, mar look at the marginal, Air for both of those is going to be big, even though it's actually not that big, right? You're just using the wrong coordinates, so to speak. So they recommend either like combining those together into a single variable, like the average of the two, or just dropping one of them to deal with that. You could, you should look at the way to find these things is by looking at they say in the book, looking at the um, uh, correlations between the different predictors. When you're like, oh great, that solves it, but no, wait, there's more. There's also multicollinear, where even that won't tell you, you won't even see it because this actually requires three parameters to see the correlation. So they recommend, there's yet another one of these uh, statistics that they want you to look at called the variance inflation factor, uh, which I hope, I didn't actually see that in the lab, but hopefully it's in there somewhere to how to look for that. I mean, it's an exercise of somewhere how to compute that with R. They give you a formula for that one though here, based on just calculating the R squared from the regression, whatever variable you're concerned with on all the other parameters. I misspelled other. You know, so that's the potential problems. And I found this section, like I said, very, did, it, did everybody else agree that this is a very helpful, practical, uh, important section of the, of this chapter in my view. Yes, I, kind of using I Kevin's do agree. Yeah, what to look out for. So I, I emphasize this one, go ahead, sorry. No, it's really good what to look out for and um, uh, what to pursue when you, you just made a model and you wanna make sure it's the right one. Yeah, I was trying to, I'm kind of using Kevin's philosophy a little bit here where we focus more on the things that we thought were more interesting, more challenging or whatever. So that's why I, I hope you guys are okay with that, where I kind of like just breeze through, uh, breeze through this um, yeah, uh, energy, I, I have interaction. Have Go ahead. Um, yeah. Um, I have a question from the previous slide please. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, the, the one on the extensions? No, the previous one, what, what, where we finished the multi, uh, collinear, collinearity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what this means, um, when they said, um, the, uh, the collinearity causes standard error to grow, what does this statement means? Let me just see if I can pull this over here. Can you see the book chapter now? Yes. 
So here they give an example. Here's the credit. So here's credit limit and credit rating shown. And you can see they're highly correlated, right, with each other. And what you get when you FET is the lower right, you'll see the beta for the rating and the beta for the limit. And you see how that the, if you, uh, how do I explain this a good way? So you can see the errors are big, bigger than maybe they should be because one of the, one, one of the parameters is making the other parameter, uh, how do I explain this right? If you looked at a side, if you looked at it down this, um, how can I, I'm, I'm doing a terrible job explaining this. I think my intuition is just that, and I could be totally wrong. It's just it makes one one of them makes the other one imprecise, right? Because then now it can slide all over that oval instead of being in a fixed position. Yeah, that's exactly what I was. That's exactly what I was trying to think of how to say. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think of. Yeah, it's, that's my intuition too, but I just can't make it more precise than that. I, yeah, another way yeah. I think of it is like if you were to like change coordinates so that you like beta minus beta rating minus beta limit, that's very narrow, right? Um, yeah, and there, cause and there is, oh, sorry, can you hear me, sorry. Um, but there, I think also yeah, we can it shows you. that they're similar, they're similar, are, uh, 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 sorry, RSS values at very different betas uh, for each of them. So like there's, like that narrow strip, like uh, you can easily with like small changes in like the data, I guess, move in kind of really far along the kind of best fit data. Uh, you know, lost him, I think. Yeah. yeah. But I think he was talking about that very last sentence, right? So it says, because of the collinearity, there are many pairs of beta limit, beta rating with a similar value for the residual sum of squares where you're looking for. Right, that's that long trend. So, yeah. Right, right, right. right. So, right, so that's right. So that's what makes the, yeah. that's what drives the air up, I guess, yeah. I have to admit that now that I've taken a closer look at it, I don't, it's one of those things I don't understand as well as I thought I did. <laughs> so now I'm going to want to go away and look yeah, think about that you. some more. So I appreciate you bringing that up. <laughs> I appreciate you for bringing that up because I need to think about that some more. Again, I think I mentioned this before that I find one of the things I find very valuable about these things is that I find out things that I thought that I understood and that I didn't understand because I didn't really think about it hard enough or somehow just let my eyes glaze over when I was reading past it. I'm like, oh, that all seems clear to me. Yeah, I think I got, I got disconnected in the middle of what I was saying. Uh, yeah, you, you did. Um, sorry. Um, hopefully this will work. What I was trying to say was that, like, if there's, um, with the one on the right with these, with this collinearity, um, small changes in the data can cause widely different best, like, like the best RSS point of on the, on the scatter plot of these two betas. Um, the small changes in the data can be way in the upper left of that plot or way in the lower right. And they can, I think because of that variance, sample to sample, like uh, like the standard error is gonna be higher. And then, like, that's like my intuition about it. Um, you know, so like, like there's, and the one on the left, there's just, it's kind of hovering around a small region because the most, most of the best fit, uh, best RSS values are going to be kind of right around that point. You know, so there isn't as much like kind of swings, dramatic swings in what the possible betas are. Yeah, I think that does make it clear. I appreciate that. I don't see, um, oh, here it is. 
Was that uh, some shooting that asked that question? I think did that help clear it up a little bit? I hope. Are you still there? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's that section. Um, the next section of the book is goes back to this marketing plan thing from the very beginning. Uh, the the thing was, is, okay, what um, what are the, uh, Kevin just disconnected, but that's not a big surprise. Um, what are the, um, so at the very beginning, I'm just going to quickly jump over here. The very beginning, the, the, the book asked a lot of questions about the advertising data. And now the, you know, now these same questions, I'm going to repeat them again. And rather than just repeat the answers from the book, which you can look at, I wanted to instead highlight what tools they use to answer these questions, just kind of from the benefit of being able to remember later what these different, we went through this book, this chapter seems really long to me. And it seems like there's a lot of things here. And so uh, my, you're the best. Here this is exactly this. what I wanted to do. And then I was just too lazy to actually do it. So <laughs> thank you for providing this. <laughs> Yeah, and maybe it's wrong, so let me know. But this is what I got okay. out of the last, last section of the thing. So the first question was, is there any kind of relationship between the advertising budget and sales? And that's they said, okay, the tool to use that is multiple regression. Look at your F statistic and also the P values. And then the next question was, how, long, how strong is the relationship? And that was um, uh, using the R squared and the RSE for that. Um, and then the next one was what media, which particular media, radio, TV, newspaper, uh, is associated. And the tool that they used for that was the p-values for each of the predictors. Um, and they said that this is gonna be explored more in chapter six, which is linear model selection and regularization. So I guess that makes some sense that that's where we're gonna explore this uh, idea, which which ones you can leave. I guess with only, a, I think my impression was if you only have a few predictors, if you could just use the p-values and not worry about it too much. Like, oh, this p-value is large, that parameter, like newspaper, for example, maybe doesn't matter. Um, but for the, um, when you have many predictors, it becomes problematic because as they say, you just, by random chance, you're going to end up with a small P value. And that doesn't necessarily mean that particular parameter is important. That particular, particular predictor is important. And they say, okay, how large is the association? And that's where you look at the confidence in intervals on your uh, slope parameters, your beta parameters. I say slope because I'm thinking linear here but it could be uh the, the, the linear coefficient i guess what you should call it. and then how accurately can we predict sales and that they say okay prediction intervals use that for the individual uh, uh individual response and then if you want an average response use a confidence interval and then is relationship linear this is where you look at the residual plots and then finally they ask is there a synergy among the different among the advertising media and that's when you look at, at interaction terms and look at the p-value for those interaction terms and, they, and then all these seven things they give details of how this actually works out for the advertising thing in the book and i certainly recommend uh digging through that so yeah if anyone I'm, i i guess um i have to like i'll clean this up and then do try to do a pull request and see if i can get it out there to everybody so that people can if they have any other corrections or changes to this thing i guess that's the way to do it i assume i haven't done it before so bear with me that's uh, right yeah Okay. And I'm Apparently, actually back now. I'm, I'm off the I'm off the Wi-Fi, so I'm able to speak. <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. So the last section of the book, which I don't again, this one of those I'm just going to glaze over, but I thought it was useful. And I do recommend uh, looking at it, and that is this section where they, especially in light of what we talked about in chapter two about the bias variance trade off, because it is a good illustration using this K nearest neighbor. If you didn't read the section, it's K nearest neighbor is essentially doing, as far as my interpretation of it, it's like a K point moving average um, of, the, of the data. So this is a non-parametric method. You don't get any insight into what one, what you know, how much sales affects or how much media uh, budget effect, affects sales, but um, it does give you something, I guess. I'm not sure what exactly, I'm not sure why you'd actually use this, <laughs> unless, but. Uh, it does work in this section, though, to help you uh, understand the bias variance trade-off because the, the larger K is, the less flexibility is, and you can see how that works out in that section of the book. Does anyone know, like, what value there is in this KNN thing other than, like, smoothing out the data? I just can't really do any predictions, I guess. I don't know. I'm not sure what it's good for. I guess we want to do predictions in between values, maybe. I don't know. Anyone have any insight? 
Yeah, I've never used it before. Um, uh, I mean, you can definitely, with this regression though, you can definitely make predictions, but I guess somehow it like embeds the, like the space that you use in your training set. You have to, you know, your test data, it's gonna be, it's gonna be, uh, there's gonna be prediction relative to those train values, I guess. I, I would think so, right? Cause you need something to like, uh compute like figure out what the neighbors are with the 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 outcome that you already know you know what i mean um, oh yeah no i see what you're saying yeah yeah no, like you, i think they're it's like, like yeah i think the test it's whatever the k nearest neighbors are yeah that's for, in the train data yeah yeah like yeah. i think i think it's like you like i think you like embed it in the train data i would guess and then like you know whatever the nearest fat neighbors are for that but but you're totally right about the um about like it, it won't extrapolate at all right so like right. A, if there's if there's data that's outside of the range of the train data like in the test set you'll just get something that's the closest but it's but it could be very far away from um the nearest neighbor from the you know uh nearest neighbor may be really kind of irrelevant but it won't it won't scale it or anything yeah i've never heard I appreciate that yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I i get the impression that they, their intent was just to try to illustrate this bias variance thing better but i also I like really the, the, else in the i also like what they talked about with this with the curse of dimensionality you know if you, if you have a bunch of dimensions you're essentially reducing your sample size because you have to find neighbors along this really high in this high dimensional space and the more and more dimensions you have the more and more data you need in order to be able to find neighbors for all points you know, um, right. or meaningful yeah. neighbors yeah and i like that i like that i thought that was a good point they made So that's all I prepared. Um, I think the plan is next time. I don't, first of all, does anyone have anything else from this chapter they want to bring up questions or things they want to hash out or things that I muddled up that you think should be made clear? No, I guess I just have a question on this K nearest neighbors regression. So the point of it is that it's just more flexible than just assuming a linear relationship, right? Or is that not correct? It can be made quite inflexible by making K large. Um, right, well. right, right. Okay. So it's not quite, I think, I thought the point, again, I thought the point of it was to illustrate this bias, bias variance thing and kind of give you an idea of an alternate way of looking at it because as far as I can tell, and, and also to give an example of a non-parametric method that, so you know what that gives you a feel of what that means, but um, that's what I got out of it. And then Kevin mentioned the third thing about the curse of dimensionality as well. Okay. But I don't see I don't see this as a very useful tool I would use very much. But hey, now I know about it. So <laughs> I see. Okay. Yeah, they, they seem to be using it to just illustrate some of these limitations of non-parametric methods and maybe that's a good reason not to use it. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know. Yeah. In the tidy models uh, group that I'm in, it's also used as kind of a negative example of how things go wrong so huh. oh okay okay that's good to know <laughs> yeah yeah i i've uh speaking of petty models i know that there's like a, a imputation method around nearest neighbors but it's um uh, but it's just on the, the data cleaning kind of process pre-processing um where you can you can fill in missing data on one dimension by or yeah, one or multiple dimensions by finding another observation that has yeah, it's it's nearest neighbor and using the mean of or the nearest neighbors or whatever it does. I don't know exactly what the how it is implemented, but I know that yeah, that exists there. Yeah. Um, mm. But but I, if I remember correctly, it kind of takes a little while to like it. It slows down the depending on the size of your data, but the big data sets I think it's a little bit slow. Um, Anyway, yeah. So a little point of uh, I don't know, 
what the word is, but just uh, the next meeting is next Sunday. I'm going to be traveling next week. I'm not, so I don't think I'm the right person to present this exercises. It's also the, the we can go over the lab too, or just write the exercise or I'm not sure what makes sense there, but whoever, somebody needs to sign up for that is what I wanted to point out. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Um, is anyone interested in signing up or can sign up for that? Um, so I think it would be kind of the lab, like basically whatever you, you think you want to focus on from the lab and the um, whoever's doing the presentation, what they want to focus on from the lab and their exercises, the applied exercises. That makes sense to me. Um, yeah, is anyone... Anyone have uh, urge to present or ability uh, you would have availability? To prepare that, um, but how yeah. about the, if we all work on it and then we have specific questions that we want to bring up? Would that work? Um, like if you're not presenting, but you want to bring up questions? I, I don't think I would I have time because I, I have a deadline coming up. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, next sure. week, so yeah. Um, yeah, no. So what I what I actually want to do, um, and this brings a, this reminds me of this. Um, with that with that point, I was I was um, what I was talking about last week in the Slack with uh, kind of that slightly different style with um, kind of Ron mentioned it, like focusing on the things that you're, you know, like like kind of the key points, the highlights, the things that you're confused by, etc. Like for the presenter, I think in that kind of framework i also think it's important like in the last third of third of the session to have time for other people's questions you know um so yeah so i so i think that that that's definitely part of it for sure um uh yeah so i, I would imagine that like you have like in that um kind of more focused style where you're not reviewing every single thing word by word for word in the chapter. Um, um, you would like kind of do a, a, a brief overview, focus in on a couple areas that you think are interesting or important or confusing as a presenter, and then have time at the end for just like you were saying, other questions and uh, topics that other people were, were particularly stuck on. Um, does that sound okay? Yeah, yeah that, that sounds, it sounds good, to good to me. Okay, yeah, I was actually gonna write that out. I kind of had time, but like write it out as like a, you know, like just state that, you know, as like a flow, um, like first thing, second thing, third thing, as like a general way we, we're we gonna approach it going forward. Um, what I was gonna say though, is I, if, if no one else can do it, I, I can do it next Sunday. Um, do the lab and the exercises. Um, Perfect. But yeah, is there is there anyone else that wants to do it? I, I, I can do it. No. Thank you for volunteering, Kevin. So it's sure, just sure. lab, right? <laughs> lab linear regression. Yeah, so I'm just looking at okay. the book right now. Yeah, there's yeah. Lab linear regression, there's simple linear regression, um, interactions. Okay. So they're just kind of showing you how to do interactions, nonlinear transformations. Um, I would imagine that I would spend the most time on the exercises. Um, yeah. Oh, a lot of the it. yeah. A lot of the lab stuff is like kind of how to do a linear model or set up an interaction. Mm -hmm. um, I think for the most part, like obviously, if there are questions come up, we can go over them. But I think for the most part, people can probably work through that themselves, I would think. And then we can that focus makes sense. on the, now looking at myself. The, yeah, there's like write how to write a function. Um, yeah. I don't know. Like I think I think uh, I think we like if questions come up, we could definitely go over them that kind of like last third. Um, but okay. I would the these applied questions look really good. Um, there are a lot, like, like, I mean, I'm just yeah, looking at now, it's like five pages of questions. So <laughs> I, I'll i have to like pick out the ones that I think are are worth, you know, going deep on. Um, 
because I, I just think like like this book is already long and what i was trying to bring up last week was that like if we it, it just seems like if we go over every single question and every single concept in depth from the chapter it's just gonna we're gonna be here next march you know um and mm -hmm. uh i'm not sure we want to do that so yeah so so i think um yeah i'll do it and i'll just uh find some so i think like you know go through as many of the exercises as you can um uh and then i'll go deep maybe into into like like five of them or something like that four or five of them and then and then i'll leave time for questions on other exercises or concepts that people got stuck on okay that sounds good and focus maybe more on the applied exercises right um yeah most likely i haven't gone through them yet so i can't okay. say for sure but i would i would think so yeah um kevin i have a question maybe you don't know this but um in former book club do you know how each chapter is two weeks and it's generally you know like the whatever the the chapter text and then the lab exercises does the one person normally do both or has it always been the case where you have two people yeah it's a good question like for this book club in particular the previous cohort yeah uh, mm -hmm. yeah um the videos i've watched of cohort three it seemed like they were doing that where it was the same person um, yeah but I'm not sure if that's true for all their chapters or all their cohorts, all their other cohorts. I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Um, I mean, I think it makes sense from like a preparation standpoint. Like if you've already kind of thought through the chapter enough to present it, um, it might be easier for you to just do the exercises too. Yeah. Um, obviously, if you don't have a conflict, uh, et cetera. But, um mm -hmm. is that what you were thinking as well or? that's that's what i figured yeah but you know yeah, with yeah. The book, i've noticed that sometimes you know there are time conflicts like scheduling conflicts, and so mm -hmm. sometimes people cannot sort of like you know say yeah i'll be on for the next two weeks just for you know reasons of life and things so yeah, um, yeah, yeah. i think that ideally that would be the case because yes if you've already gone into reading the chapter you know and to the point where you're explaining concepts then you probably already well into you know the material and being able to do the exercises better than you know just some other person but um we can also sort of like see how um how it how it goes with our group um in terms of like time and who can do what and if it works you know with people splitting it up then that's probably fine too yeah i mean i i do agree with you in this particular case pranika had a conflict so i you know we, yeah. this particular one got split up a little bit but hopefully going forward, we can make it more uh, consistent, like you say, because it would be a lot less. It takes a lot of effort, even like I found out that I really had to dig into the chapter a lot more than I did when I read it the first time. And I had to kind of reread it a little bit, mm -hmm. get more deeper into it so I can see how you're, what you're saying is that it does make sense for that same person then to go on and do the exercises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to do it myself, yeah. except I just won't be able to because of travel. I think I'll be able to make the actual meeting. I'll be back, but I won't have any chance to really do any work. I'll be playing. I'll be in Vegas, so I'm not gonna be doing any oh, nice. statistics. Well, I'll be doing some statistics at the at the roulette table. Practical, <laughs> very applied. applied. <laughs> yeah. If you if you do too many statistics, you might get kicked out. So, uh, yeah, exactly. Actually, you do too many statistics, you won't want to play. You'll be like, wait, this is dumb. That's true. <laughs> I did the math. <laughs> right, right. You have to have right. a willing well, suspension guess, of disbelief. I guess not statistics. Counting, counting would be would be. <laughs> oh, uh, that's true. That's true. Probability. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, by the way, did you did you get hear any of what I was saying about that when I was on the the yes. collinearity the second thing? time? Okay. Yeah. Oh, you did. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think it. I think that like. Yeah. I think because the the coefficients can swing so dramatically for like that that basin of like the best. RSS value can be have such different betas that it just inflates the standard error because you know they're they're swinging so far up and down that axis you know um, and I think part of that reason yeah, I, I apologize to uh, 
I have to apologize okay. to Sam Sam Sudin because he, when he originally got the question, like, oh yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. And I started trying to explain what was in my head, and yeah, I yeah. realized, oh, I just have this like intuitive feel that's not very yeah. well articulated. <laughs> so I, thanks for I jumping also, in and saving us on that one. No, I mean it, this is also kind of intuitive as well, but um, uh, it, I think yeah. But um, I also think like the other intuitive thing I was thinking is that if you have two predictors that are essentially the same thing, like if one has a large beta and one has a very small beta, those can be kind of like interchangeable, you know, like the other one could have that same beta and the other one could have a very small beta. Like they, there's like, uh, they could kind of like, I, I don't know if that makes any sense, but um, yeah, it like, does. like they can kind of be exchanged for each other. Um, and uh, you'd still get a similar prediction. Um, and there's like a, a, a kind of a wide range of combinations of betas that could work with a similar RSS value, you know, um, at least mm -hmm. that's how I'm thinking through it. Yeah, yeah. that's, I get that, that makes um, a lot of sense actually. Yeah. All right, um, all right, so I'll, yeah, so I'll start at five. Um, I'll do- Hey, what you're to put it a different way, Go ahead. Sorry. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just thinking through what you said. To put it another way, like you said, let's suppose you had two parameters that were exactly the same parameter. You just put them in twice by mistake. In fact, the book talks about this. I, I think um, you would see that if I had well, one had a parameter of five, and the other one had a parameter of one. Let's say it was just when I swapped them around, I still have the same prediction, exactly the same prediction, one and five versus five and one, but. Um, uh, but that's a lot of wiggle room. I can move those, each one of those parameters by, as long as I move the other one the other way. And that's kind of what happens there, right? Because they're yeah, uh, they're mm. exactly the same. Again, that yeah. was much cleaner, much clearer in my so, head than what it coming out. But. So, right, exactly. Like if you, if it's just like a simple like identity or like a bit, like like yeah. if you add, if you add like five to one side and take off five from the other, like it's the same. Um, <laughs> I don't know that never mind but anyway i think we are we're we're in the same intuitive space now yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, we need we just need some some harder math i think to, to round it up yeah. but, um, all right yeah and i was actually reading through the next chapter a little bit or just a regression and, yeah it's gonna be fun i, I think we're starting to get into the exciting, more exciting stuff. Um, so, um, cool. All right. Anything? All right. Else? We'll uh, yeah. Thanks so much, Ron, for jumping in here. Uh, I really appreciate. It. Yeah. Yeah. You be, being flexible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm put a poll request and see if I can get them put up there. I think I did notice. I looked at the videos that some of the other previous. People had more notes on this these sections, and I don't know what happened to those, mm -hmm. but I guess they didn't mm -hmm. put them in. So I'm gonna try to put these in their videos. So something's there. In their videos. Yeah, in their videos. You see, yeah, in their videos. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, let me just ping me if you have trouble with that. Um, there's some good steps that okay. John put together using uh, use this um, as like right. a no, nice I was using that. <laughs> But you were okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah, because like it's kind of confusing if you don't do that with like forking and then um, like your it's easy to have your local version be out of sync with the master and anyway. Um, yeah, I got that. Yeah. So very good. All right, thanks guys. Right. I appreciate it. Education. Great. Thank as you always. so much, Ron. Thank thanks. you. Uh, all right, have a good one. Bye. Yep. You too.